My name is Alessandra Moctezuma and I'm the gallery director here at Mesa College. I also teach the classes in museum studies. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening for a lecture of James and Judith Christensen. And I'll just tell you a little um, story of, of how the show came about. Several years ago, like maybe four years ago? Three years, three years ago. Three years ago. Uh, I, um, I went over to, uh, to Judith's and Jim's house uh, because I was going to look at Judith's work and we were going to talk about possibility of an exhibition. And uh, when I uh, went to their uh, house, she actually had most of her work in uh, Jim's studio. So she was showing me her, her books there and, and I was um, very interested, but I was, as, I, as we were looking around, surrounding me were all these works by Jim, paintings and sculptures. And so for a while, I had been thinking about the creative process. And as an artist myself, and uh, thinking back in, in, for example, graduate school, where I was working with other student artists, and, and we were bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, I had been pondering about bringing a couple and having them do an exhibition together to see, even though they do their own unique and individual works, you can still see resonances maybe of each other in the pieces. And so, so that's how I came up with the idea that just instead of just doing Judy, uh, Judy's books, that we should do a joint, a joint exhibit. So uh, I think that, it, that when you go and see the exhibition, everything uh, flows very nicely together and um, and I love the idea of the exhibit dealing with um, with memory with how memories um, help us you know uh, build our um, our life story and the metaphor of the of, of the houses and the book about uh, Judy's uh, family home and uh, and then um, how they've incorporated also their, their present home. And then the other reason that um, this exhibit was, was a lot of fun for, uh, for our students is that Jim's work deals with uh, the museum world, in a sense, too. And my museum studies class helps put together the exhibitions. And Jim had been creating crates for museums. And the crates are sometimes more, more, more labor is involved in creating them than uh, than maybe some of the, the, the gesture drawings that are in, in the crate. So I thought that was interesting. You know, what about how does our society, how do we value things, you know? And how do, when we change the context of where an object is shown, you know, we change the value of, of the piece. So, so we're, I was pondering about that, and, and as I was showing my students, I was, um, I think that it was just a perfect fit. Um, this was very much a collaboration. Uh, not only between Jim and, and Judy, but my students were learned so much from working with them in, in the whole uh, process of, of, of uh, creating the exhibition. And so I want to thank my students who are here and, and also all the team that, that helps in the gallery, uh, Pat Vine and Susan Maryland and Jackie and Sharon. So thanks to all of those people. Thank you. Yeah, we should. I, before we start, I just want a, a big thank you to Alessandra for giving us this opportunity <clears throat> and to Pat Vine, who was there every day, and to the, to the students who are just amazing. They will do anything you ask. <laughs> they will scrape little spots off the floor. I, I mean, I've never been with a group the Alessandra Pat, the students who are just so wonderful to work with. Their, their attitudes are great. It's the morale. It's really a wonderful place. It was, it was just a pleasant place to be and do the installation. And we really enjoyed it. Thank you. You're going to talk first. So I'm going to sit yeah, I'll down talk and first. listen. <laughs> you want uh, me to get the lights? Yeah, get the lights. And then we'll... What I've done here, I've. I've we, you've noticed that we both work a little differently. Judy uses a lot of, uh, or Judith uses a lot of words. I can call you Judy? <laughs> okay, she's Judy. I'm Jim. I mean, that's, 
that's normal. And, uh, this is sort of professional. So, um, mostly what I do is deal with objects and images, and I have for years. And so what I've done here, and, we, and the show being about memory, when I was looking through uh, slides and things to bring here for the talk, I decided to not deal with anything that's actually in the show because you can see that. And so I brought along slides, or these really aren't slides anymore, but images uh, of older work that in some ways has relationships to what's in the show in kind of where the things in the show may have come from, some of the uh, coloration, uh, the, the ideas that have actually led up to some of the ideas I'm working with now. Um, the, this, this stuff goes back lots of years and there, it's, I broke it into like three, maybe three or four sections, maybe three. And the first is paintings that I did. I, I started mostly painting in art. And, uh, over, over time, the paintings have evolved into different things. If you've seen, you, well, you saw the show, so everyone saw the hats. And the hats are really an extension of some other things that I was dealing with before that. The, the format that the hats are, the circular uh, wrapping of the image, I'd actually done that before with, with column pieces. And so I have a few of those in here. But the whole the whole direction where it all kind of started is, is going to be illustrated in the slides as we, we go along, or the images. This is a very early painting. And um, this, uh, in, in the show, there's a mask in, in the crate. That one crate is called the Museum of Man. And that's, that's a self-portrait mask. Th this here is a self-portrait painting. When I was thinking of what it, what it meant to, you know, how you describe yourself, you know, and, and I got involved in, can I describe myself in what I wear rather than with who I am personally? And so I took old, my old clothes and I, I hung them up and I, I constructed this painting. And over time, this painting and the following two or three, um, have a similarity. They're all similar in that the backgrounds tend to be uh, mon one color, or this one's two, but the others are one. Uh, and the colors are really kind of popish. And it, I, I've been told, oh, they're pop art. And at first I was sort of taken back by the idea that they were pop. But now, looking at them in a, well, in a, with a lot of time in between when I did them and, and now that they exist on their own. I think they are and I think there were pop influences in these paintings because it was the time I grew up in, it's the things I was, I was seeing, it's the things I remembered but that I maybe didn't remember, you know, that were embedded memory, that were actually feeding in to what I was then doing when I thought I was doing something that only I was doing, I was really reiterating ideas that were in in the uh, culture at the time. And so these images are kind of based on that kind of understanding. And uh, even in here, this is kind of, there's a lot of spraying that is was done in the show that you looked at, the uh, cabinets and things. This is when I started spraying. This, this shirt, the orange shirt here, is actually airbrushed. And there's a, this, this glow on the edges is a spray paint. So I, I was already working, and the rest of it's all oil paint, hand painted with oil. So there's like this mixing that was going on even early on with trying to define an image. And also trying to define a space. That, I got very interested in the negative space too, and, and what it what it was like that atmosphere behind the central image when you were building building the the painting, and so this one and then this one, uh, it became it was important that 
for one thing, that they weren't centered to the, to the, to the image, that this had its own weight and power to it. That, that that negative space, you know, you're in art class and they talk about negative space and positive space, and you start thinking, okay, negative space, positive space. You know, it's, it relates a lot to sculpture. It doesn't often relate to painting because you're dealing with composition in painting. You're dealing with flow, like where your eye travels and how it travels in the picture. And I was thinking, well, I want the negative space of my painting to be, you know, have its own, like, body, its own strength. And so I was dealing with offsetting images and trying to stay away from certain themes that, other other people were working in and then this painting was really early on and at the time the women's movement was in its early stages and there was shrugging off bras and it was a very funny kind of idea and uh, Judy had an old bra and so it ended up on a stool that we had and <laughs> So, like, even in the show there, there's humorous things, that, you know, that are going on with the paint sticks and contemporary art. And here we've got social commentary with the, the bra and the stool. Um, so, I, I've always thought art should be a little funny. You know, and it's not openly funny. It's not a joke that's so easily found all the time. This is a self, I, I know, this one's a self-portrait, obviously. <laughs> that I built off, I, I decided I really needed to do a self-portrait with me in it. And so I worked off a, off a mirror. It's a very difficult thing to do, and I haven't done much since with that. Uh, but again, it has the same influences that the two before it had. And it has the hot background, that pop background. Uh, here I expanded the background a little bit into a, a little different uh, range. Give, uh, I wanted more depth to it. I wanted to have a ground and a sky. So then I, I decided to take some of the elements I'd been working with before, the clothing, and use them at, as more as, as my landscape and then put, put the fire hydrant on it. This painting actually has a very funny story because this painting was at the San Diego Museum. And it happened to be put at the museum at a time period when there was an oil shortage. And <coughs> Richard Riley wrote this article and mentioned the painting in it. And he was, he was taken back by, he, he thought it was such a good social commentary on an oil valve. And I read it and I thought, oil valve? And, you know, it, it's a fire hydrant. Everyone should know that, right? <laughs> you look at them every day, right? And then I realized, you really see what you think you see. You don't see necessarily what is there. And then years later, this um, fireman was looking at this painting. And he said, where did you get that image? And I said, well, it was a fire hydrant in my parents' neighborhood when they first moved in, and the, 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 the uh, development was there, and they, these fire hydrants were just, they were there all before the houses, and it was fascinating to see these like fire hydrants and nothing behind them. And he said, well, you know, it's really unusual because that's a commercial fire hydrant, and you're telling me it was in a residential neighborhood. And I'm like, I don't know the difference, right? I'm not a fireman. And so th that, this, this thing has its like, own little history to it. Right? The, over time, I keep going, you know, find little new things out about it. But this is a painting, a big painting. It's about that size. It is really a painting from a painting. You, you saw the original painting in the show, and then I was fascinated, really, with this one section of it. And... It, it sort of had a life of its own. So I did this big painting of, this, of that painting. <laughs> and uh, again, it was kind of a funny thing to do at the time. Uh, I've always liked this painting. Mm -hmm. This is a painting I really like. Um, 
this this was called uh, American what was it American Dream or something or something. something like that. It it was in a show at San Diego Museum when they did this show about California landscapes. And there is a funny story about this one because I was standing there uh, listening to people talking about the paintings. I mean, we were at the show, and there was a couple in front of this painting, and she was just. Adam, and she's like, I hate this painting. <laughs> and so I got interested. <laughs> and she goes, that's not my idea of an American dream. You know? And I'm thinking, well, you know, it's not, it's not mine either, really. <laughs> but this is what was being offered to everyone. I mean, my, this is a house from my mom's neighborhood. It's, you know, it's a university city house. We've all seen it. it it's, doesn't look that stripped down. But then I thought, you know, it's funny because I thought it was just funny pain. You know, the idea of this precious house on a pillow. And uh, here she's so offended by it because it somehow offended her idea of an American dream. And yet I'm sure a lot of people really would have liked to have had that house at that time. You know, it's the world's a big place. <laughs> and it, it's just interesting how people see things differently and, and how they relate to things in these almost emotional terms when there's, there's it's not a threatening painting, I don't think. I mean, I don't know. Do you think it's a threatening painting? No. She, she did seem threatened by it. And what's interesting is she was one of the other artists in this show, she had another a painting of her own, which was actually very good, and I, I actually liked it. Um, but it wasn't anything like this. Um, <laughs> this is a series of small works, and they're very intimate, little. Um, I'd call them drawings, but before the scanners were out. Before we had digital images, um, I was interested in the photo image, but the photo image in a drawn context. And so what I was doing was taking photos that I had, and I would draw on them, and then I would Xerox them onto vellum. And then I would take the vellum and draw on it, and then re-Xerox it. And to do that, I had to find this particular Xerox that would allow the vellum to go through it without turning it into popcorn. <laughs> and now I look at these and I think, well, you know, I could do these without any problem on them. <laughs> the inkjet printer and get almost the same effect that I was having to build up. And it, it wasn't that long ago, you know. And it always amazes me now how fast this technology has changed and how incredible it is. But these, these have a narrative to them. There, there was a lot of talk about narrative, and so I, I was working on a series of drawings that had sort of an implied secret going on, and they, they come in a, like a series. There's, there may be three of these. I, don't, I think I only have two in here. But they suggest something happening. And again, I was still interested in this negative space, the, the space outside of the folk <coughs> point. That it's kind of the mystery space. And here, it see, I, these have these scrims built into them that allow this portion that, that I wasn't focusing on to still be in the imagery to kind of draw you in. And then as they evolved, I eventually turned them into a couple very long pieces. Actually, it's about this, eh, it's a little smaller than this, but it's close. It's about that size. But now this one, I actually took, 
the others I, I taped together and kind of built them up, and I was taking them to this architectural um, machine that they could run a long vellum through. And so then I, I, I drew on that one and got it all colored the way I wanted it. And I took it back and I had it run black and white to the, this scale. And then went back in and, and colored out this one. Um, they, it worked pretty well. It was really kind of time intensive and started to get costly. But uh, it, had, it had a kind of fascinating depth to it that I was intrigued by. Now, this, this is within that group, but it's like a singular piece, and it's really very small. And I put this in here because this then relates to what's coming up. Uh, this image, I called it the sitting room. It was, it's a room actually at the Iwani Hotel in Yosemite Park. It's the most beautiful room. You, in the winter, you can sit in there, and it's very warm, and there's this big, that big window, and, and you look out, and it's a very quiet room. It, it's off the main... Uh, it's off the main... There's a big main room. I, I don't know what it is exactly. It's kind of like a huge living room space or something. And then there's... This one's just beyond it, on a little kind of end of the building, and it has windows really all around it. So you're kind of out there, and it's very quiet. And it, it was, we spent a, quite a bit of time in it this one day. It was cold outside, and it was just so magical in there. Um, so I, I did this one called The Sitting Room, and then I did it again later in, in another form. Um, okay. I started doing these columns, and they really grew out of a, a crating job I did. I did a crating job for Newton Harrison, Helen, Newton and Helen Harrison, in which we were, they do these very large paper on canvas mappings, and uh, they're, they have to be rolled to be shipped, and so we built a whole bunch of crates with these tubes inside that had these ethophone kind of little sl sleeves around the end to, to suspend the work so it wasn't touching anything. And I was doing it with a friend of mine, Bill Mosley, and he was helping me, and he, Bill said, you know, you could paint on these, because we were actually wrapping them with canvas to keep their work clean, so we were gluing this canvas on them. And so a few years later, I actually started doing this series of columns, really from that conversation with Bill. And Bill's a painter, too, here, and he teaches that at Grosbach. But this was the first one, and it, this is actually a model. It's about this tall. I made a big one that's about eight feet tall. It's similar to this. Oh, and here's Bill. This one's probably the closest one to the Harrison's. Just it was they were long tubes like that with little hands, and uh, so I put Bill on one. I thought he needed to be there, and he I, that's only one side of it. You can turn them and they wrap around just like the hats do. Now, this this one's called the Flower Field Workers, and in this one, this one's about this big. <laughs> Looks really nice that, uh, and it's very textural. This, I started using modeling paste on some of these and building up the texture and then painting over it and uh, kind of modeling it, really. And then putting, like, now I've got the gold leaf in here. And, and you saw it again on the, on the water buffalo in there. Uh, it's just such a wonderful kind of surface. It's, and now here, here's the sitting room again. I, I, this is where I reinterpreted it onto a cylinder. And this one is eight feet tall. It doesn't look, it's actually taller than that. Um, 
and it has the whole that whole image you saw before is actually all the way around it. This is from a, a series that I did on work that was up in Seattle in a show. And it's really charcoal on paper. And it was about work. And it was about where we were living in LA at the time in this studio and watching these people outside who were tearing down a building. And again, about construction. And in this show, I actually turned it kind of, some of it into a form of installation. It's very quiet installation. It, I brought some of the outer elements into the <coughs> foreground, the things that we were on the streets when these people were working. And then this one was a narrative piece that I did, uh, sort of describing this job as it was being done. And this is this is a, from the show. And I brought this one because it, this one, at the same time I started these columns, I was also doing those, the workers, because they were actually outside working, and I was inside <laughs> working on these. And so I did this little model of this, what could be an installation at some point. At the time I did the model, the guys in the building were actually building a corrugated fence outside the building where we lived on for their parking lot. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing these elements and I'm kind of putting them together in a, a visual thing to remember it all about later on. And I think that's the last one I brought along. Yep, now we're on to Judy. So, I don't know if I explained it clearly or anything, but hopefully you can see there's kind of a continuity of, of things that I carry over in, from one thing to another, whether it's material use or you know, spatial relationships or you know, s some of the techniques that I start with in one place, I re uh, kind of reinterpret into another thing. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Judy, and, and she'll talk about her work. I didn't put the images in chronological order, except this is the first book that I ever did. And people often ask me, how long does it take you to do a book? Well, this took, um, it was, this is an edition of 10, and it probably took three years to do. So I, I wasn't working on it full-time. Um, but it is the first book that I did. I was, I was writing about art. I was not, Jim was the artist in the family. I did not work with images. I did not work with art. I looked at art and wrote about it. And I was very interested in artist books. But the more I tried to find information about it, articles, books about it, there just was not a lot written. Ian Tyson, who is a an uh, artist, uh, book artist from Europe, was teaching a class at UCSD, and the gallery director out there at the time, Jerry McAllister, said, "Well, why don't you audit his class, and he's going to talk about book arts and the history of it because he's been in it a long time. He knows a lot about what's going on, what's gone on." So I said to him, can I audit your class? And he said, yes, but you have to make a book. And I thought, huh, how, how hard can that be? <laughs> well, at the end of the quarter, I had one page done. <laughs> and this is the book. When I was trying to find something to make a book out of, I went through my old journals. And the only thing that was in my journals that had images with them, because I'm not an image person, was notes that I had made about places that we had lived and how the sun came into a room. I was kind of, when I was in younger, I was kind of like a cat and followed the sun, because I did a lot of readings. So I'd follow the sun around the house or outside with my book or my 
you know, whatever I was writing. We didn't have to worry about computers then and sit at a desk. We could go anywhere with our books and, and paper tablets. So each set of pages is one place that we've lived, or I've lived. There's a couple that, that I lived without Jim. And um, where, how the sun came into the room, this one in the morning, and this one was a studio that we had in Santa Barbara. And other places that we've lived. So I'm just going to page through them. And this is the book. What you saw before was just opening it like a book and paging through. This is the book spread out. Book artists talk a lot. When we talk about our books, we talk about structure. This is an accordion structure. It's, you know, like an accordion. It goes back and forth. Some of the books in the show were accordions. And an accordion is a pretty favorite uh, structure because it displays so nicely. If you make a book, like most of the books that you read are codexes. You open and if you put them in, you make a book that way and put it in a show, you can see two pages. With an accordion, you can open it up and really see the book. And so it's a nice format. This one is also an accordion, but because it's not out of paper, it's out of, um, this is um, tea towels, you know, the white towels that you just buy at the, the store that you dry dishes with, and then old bread pan, because it's a story about making bread. And it opens, and then it opens like, this is an accordion style. I was working in, this was done about the same time as the, the glove piece that's in the show. I was working in fabric at the time because I had a daughter who was, at that time she was two or three. And paper is very fragile. If you're making something and you've got, you know, your pa page is all done, you're working on it, and a little girl comes and grabs it, ruined. You can't, you know, can't get the creases out of the paper. Fabric is indestructible. She could come up and go, what's this? <laughs> no problem. So for, that's really why I was working in fabric for a while. So this is it opening up. And I think that's all the way open, yeah. And it was a short story that I had written about um, A woman whose husband had left her, and so she was in the kitchen making bread, and there was something about the process of the making of the bread that kind of restored her, her faith in herself as a person. And I can remember as a child, my mother made bread, and it would be in a room, it would be rising in a room, and the door would be closed, the sun would be coming in, because it took the heat to make the bread rise, and we could not go in that room because you, you know cold air would come rushing in and the, it would fall. And then I remembered when the bread came out and that smell of freshly baked bread, and then you slather the butter on. <laughs> so it's wonderful memories. And it even has the recipe. This is the book that's in the show, and the reason that I put it in here is that it is an accordion structure. The spine here is the accordion, and then the pages are sewn onto that structure. If you do it with just one page, you get a book that you can still spread out, although not as much as flat as an accordion. But if you use, put the pages on differently, if you cut them, make them shorter, oh, um, you get, I'm going to go one past it, you get a flag book. So you can see the spine in the back there is an accordion, and then these pages are glued on one side of the accordion, and these are glued on the other. So you can open it like a book and read 
you know, the three pages and turn the three pages and turn the three pages. And it's like a book, regular book. But when you spread it out, pages go different directions and you get a flag book. This particular book was um, in a show about the theme was Aunt Anne Frank. And it's about, it's um, journals from children who were in um, the Second World War. And their fam they were separated from their families or their families were, they lost most of their family. So it has, on the back, on one side is the words of the child from their journal. And on the other side is the factual information about what was happening. So when you, it's, it's a good structure for when you have different layers of information. This is, um, there's no images in this book. I used the text as an image or as the, the visual. I was invited to be in a book just for, or, or show just for flag books. So I started thinking about the structure, because when I learned about bookmaking, it was content, structure, content, structure. Those have to go together. So what's the essential structure of a flag book? And to me, it was those pages going in different directions. So I came up with uh, words that, they're not oxymorons exactly, but they just don't go together. So let's see if I can read them. Gentle violence is one of them. And frugal indulgence. I like that one. If I could just master frugal indulgence, I could, I could go there. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, I called it mixed messages because it's words that when you put them together, they pull you two different ways, just like the structure of the book does. And that's when it's open. This is a tiny book. It's only about that big. I think one of the things that keeps artists interested in doing art is that you're always solving problems. This book, the, the pages are um, a vellum, so you can, you can kind of see through them. And normally, you, that would be glued to the spine right there. Well, when I tried that, the glue, you could, just, you could see the glue. And it looked horrible. And I thought, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to keep this book together? And so I ended up using pieces of the, um, I guess this was the end papers, and actually weaving in and out to keep the pages in the book. So there's no glue on those pages. They're actually sewn in with, with paper instead of thread. And that's what, that's what we do as artists. We figure out where we want to go, and it's never, it, it's never the way we think it's going to be. We think, oh, I'll just do this and this and this, and there's always complications. So that's what keeps it interesting. This is the book that's in the show, and it's a flag book, which you're, when you're taught flag, the flag book structure, they say, okay, use stiff paper, because otherwise it's not going to do that thing where it goes different directions. Well, when I did this book, I thought, well, I'm going to use really thin, floppy paper and see what happens. And this is what happens. And since it's about the river, I thought, that works. <laughs> so once you know the rules, then you can break them. At the time that I was doing these, I was thinking about art, collecting art, buying art. As an artist, I know how much time goes into art and how much it should really cost. As a human being, just as a person, I don't buy a lot of art. I love it, but I don't, I don't purchase a lot of it. Even though it's, it's really a, a, 
a lot of value for what, what it is, because it's handmade. A lot of it is one of a kind. I was looking at uh, this magazine the other day, and okay, here's all the shoes. And I tried to find the cheapest pair. It was $252, ranging all the way up to $2,600. And Jim's going, you know, art really is a bargain. <laughs> the bags were anywhere from $80 to $3,000. So yeah, art's a bargain. But at this time, I was thinking, OK, I'm going to make books that anyone can afford, even a kid so that everybody can have some art. And I knew it had to be small. So these books, these are books, and they're small by an inch and a half. And we were traveling then. So I did three series. Volume one was walking, volume two was road trips, and volume three was places that we flew. And the backs were all images. And the fronts were some little saying that I developed about, wrote about where we went or, you know, how I felt there, that kind of thing. And I printed them, I, I think, 10 up, you know, so there would be 10 and then just cut them. So it was a whole image, but it would be cut up. So I, it had to be easy to produce, and there had to be a lot of them. And then I had to figure out, well, how are you going to get people to buy them? So I got a vending machine. <laughs> and it works. You put in four quarters, and you get a book. And here's the full length of it. And it was, it was nice to get feedback about it. I'd go down to the art store and buy paper or something, and I give them my credit card, and they go, oh, you're Judith Christensen. I've got one of your little books. And it says, and they could quote it because it was a one-liner. And then, oh, my favorite is this one. My friend has this one. So it was a lot of fun to do for a while. But now, people own these. Like, there's one at UCSD, and there's one at the Athenaeum, and they're all out of books, and they go, we need more books, <laughs> and then I have to make more books. And I've probably made about 500 of these. <laughs> I said, after tw March 25th, you can have more books. <laughs> um, from that series came this series, which is about traveling also. When I go places, I pick up sticks, rocks, and they seem so unique. And I take them home and I put them in a basket, and I know I will remember forever where that rock or stick came from. And a year later, I don't know, one from the other. <laughs> so we went to Gibraltar, and I had to get a piece of the rock. And I thought, this time I am not going to forget where it came from. So I made, this was the first in the series, and I made a little book. These are matchbook sized, so the little drawer, so it's like two matchbook, um, match boxes, I guess they're called, one on top of the other. And there's a map of it, and there's a book in the top drawer, and then a little rock in the other drawer. And each one of, of these is a series of, of ten. So there's Gibraltar, and this is Mountain King. Hildy's here. <laughs> Somewhere. You are. There you are. That's where she had, we visited her there. And Anza Borrego. And this is a whole group of them. And this one is the last one. It's coming home because once you travel, you have to come home. And it reads, even when I don't miss them. I'm glad to come home to my bed and shower. <laughs> um, every couple of years, the San Diego Book Arts is invited to do a show at the Japanese Garden. And I think this was from the first one. Um, it's called Kimonos. And this is the whole piece. And each row 
has, these are the pages. This is a book, right? Does it look like a book? This is a book. This is a sculptural book. And so each one of these is a page, and it has part of the story printed on it. And then it's turned, I wanted to see, be able to see the form of the kimono. So each row alternates. So you can't read the whole story, but it's there. And there's a close-up of the, I really love that form, the origami kimono. And then the text is there. And this is the one that I did for, there's a show up right now, actually, of San Diego Book Arts at the Japanese Gardens. And this is the one that I did this year. These are origami dresses, and it's called From the Remnant Table. And when I was growing up, my mother sewed all of our dresses. And to get a good bargain on fabric, you'd go to the remnant table. Because you had a better chance of getting new clothes <laughs> than buying it by the bolt. So you'd look through the remnants and they were stacked. You know, they'd be on a table like this and they'd be stacked like this high. And you might find something that you really liked. You could see a little edge of it underneath. And, you know, you'd have to pull them up and then pull out that one. And hopefully the ones, all this whole stack on top wouldn't fall on the floor. <laughs> But sometimes you'd, have, you'd get these great finds in the remnant table. Well, I was cleaning out, about this time, I was cleaning out um, my file drawers, all my old writings, which never went, you know, the ones that didn't go anywhere. But I'd read this paragraph, and I really liked the paragraph. Maybe the story didn't work or whatever. And so I didn't want to throw them out. So that's what... Each one of these is from a different file, the parts that I wanted to keep. So they're from my remnant table, because my files were getting like that, where you know you try to pull one out, and the one three next to it would come out, and then all the papers would fall on the floor. It was really time to clean out. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to clean out, but the things that I want to save went into this piece, the writings that I wanted to save. So it's my writing remnant table that it came from. And there's a close-up of one of them. So cute. And that's it. So does anybody have any questions about anything that we've shown or anything that was in the show that Uh, in the little matchbook book that, uh, that was coming home. Was oh, a box? piece of tile. Yeah. Not from our house. It was a, jo a tile job. I, when my daughter was really young, I was doing tile jobs. No, that was actually from um, a friend's house. Okay. I, I still have that tile from Oaxaca. I haven't done anything. I have a lot of stuff that I haven't done something with yet. Sorry. <laughs> Question. I have a question about the the piece that you did with Jim that you did with the the cones out in front. Yeah. What was that? What was the media? Um, <clears throat> pastels. It was black? pastel. Uh, oh, the black is yeah. photo backdrop paper. So that's that big process, the process that you were doing before. No, no, that was these these were different. They were really just drawings. Pastel drawings on photo backdrop paper. Okay. It was real immediate for the space. We actually, the big drawings were actually done at the gallery in Seattle. Um, we had about a week to set up. And, yeah. um, and it was raining the whole time. It was perfect. Yeah, and so I didn't want to take, I did, there's, there's a series of smaller drawings that go with that that are similar. And then the big drawings were done there, and then they shipped them back to us after the show. <clears throat> and actually, I've never seen them since. They've been rolled up. They're packed. <laughs> and that was years ago. Yeah. Okay, one more question. When you did the columns, do you, do you work when it's flat and then wrap it? No. no you paint on the columns. Well, that's not true. There's one I'm working on 
Well, I've been working on it for 12, 13 years. <laughs> <laughs> it never gets finished. It was a painting I didn't like that I wrapped around a column. The ones that are in the, sh those that I showed you, no, they were, well, they were a combination. The models, the maquettes, the small ones, are drawings that I wrap around. And then the big paintings were done on the column. They're just, a canvas is mounted on there and then it, with glue and everything, and then it's painted on the column. Uh, I was fascinated with the piece that you have in the gallery. The two windows was all the glass, it was all the gloves, and then the broken glass on the bottom. Mm -hmm. was about that one. Well, those are gloves that I saved for what twenty years. <laughs> we don't want to say. <laughs> Maybe more. Uh, that I wore out, and I just throw them in a box in the garage. And I've always wanted to do something with them. And when this show came up, and I've been really busy for the last two years, and then the show was getting closer and closer, <laughs> and we had a fairly large wall there, so I wanted to, I started thinking, well, maybe I could do like an installation with the wall, and we had, we had remodeled the house last year, and we redid a bathroom, and we'd taken out all the cabinet, those cabinet pieces that I had built years ago when we first remodeled the bathroom. And when, we, when they were stripped out, I didn't want to throw them away, so I put them in the garage. And You should see our garage. Then the, the two glass doors, I actually had installed on a house in Mission Hills for some friends of mine. And then we remodeled their house, and the doors, that room was totally demolished. And those doors were going to be thrown away, and they were only like three years old. And when he was taking them out, he actually... I don't know how he did it, but he drove a hammer through that back bottom pane on that one door. So he was going to throw them in the dumpster, and I said, well, you know, they're pretty good doors, and I could fix that, right? So I took the doors. And, and I they went in our garage. And they went in our garage. <laughs> <laughs> and so when the show got closer, I, I was in the garage one day, and I, I talked about using the gloves, and then I thought, well, you know, I've got all these other pieces here, and I can actually build a wall, you know, with these, these pieces in it. And each piece is really a piece of mine. I mean, I, I made each piece, right, at one time or another. And I'll just reuse them in this form and incorporate them all as, as a unit here. So that's where the gloves come from, and, and then the rest kind of follows a chain. And it's a self portrait. Yeah, it's <laughs> sort of a self portrait. Yeah. So, while the two of you are working on this show together, was there a lot of interaction between the two of you, or did you develop the pieces kind of separately? Or? We developed the pieces separately, and then I'd go down to the studio and go, I need a consult. <laughs> and he'd come up and answer my question, or he'd come up and go, So, I, I want to ask you a question. And I'd go down. So, there was a lot of back and forth but a lot of independence. But we do a lot of problem solving. She, she did the, the houses, the little uh, subdivision. Okay, I build things, so I help with how we mount the stuff. You know, and, and then we, we kind of work together on getting those, the technical things kind of worked out together height and stuff like that. And we steal things from my studio, and <laughs> foam core, old painting, you know, whatever, whatever, put it, you know, re redo it for her stuff. You seem to be very involved in the house and Yes, <laughs> you could say that. We didn't, we didn't hear her question. She said, you seem to be very involved in houses. <laughs> and. Uh, Talk a little about that. And how it's developed so much into this. Well, um, we only have. <laughs> yeah, it's just complicated. It's a three day. Discussion. I'll make it real quick. I've, I've always worked for myself and have done a lot of remodeling. Judy's worked with me on a lot of things. We've redone our house 
innumerable times. But we've also done a lot of work for our friends and other people on their houses. And so it's something we're, we're, we've been engaged in for years now, and, uh, and we still do. I mean, I do museum crating, but when crating's slow, I do remodeling. <laughs> um, so yeah, houses are they're part of what we do. We, we built a studio in Los, Los Angeles, re, redid a space into a whole art studio, an industrial space. So, so we've been involved with the house and, and living space for a long time, and for years now. And well, Hildy, a friend of ours, we've worked on her house and the Coopers. <laughs> and there are there's people. Yeah. <laughs> I worked on your house. These people are the Hessingers, my mom. <laughs> yeah. So. Also, also, I just, when I was describing the show to people today when they were walking in and you were busy, so I was talking about the exhibit. And we talk about memory, you know, in the press, in the press release is one of the things that we mentioned, the idea of memory. But the house is really a recurrent uh, visual in the, throughout the exhibit. And, and I was thinking that you both, like, you know, you make your home. I mean, Jim, you build it, but, but Judy also, you work in the garden. So it's, it's like, also, I see it as this collaboration that, that you're oh, making yeah. a home, <laughs> but you're making a house. And, uh, and then I was, I was looking at the houses that are covered in, in the seeds. Uh, I was also thinking, and maybe this is my own take on it, like you say, Jim, we all have our own interpretations of things, but um, that those subdivisions are kind of destroying our, our landscape, in a sense. We're building and we're, you know, kind of uh, erasing, you know, the natural landscape. And then you are covering them up with the seeds that come from the garden that you've planted. And so it's kind of like, I see it as a reclaiming, you know, in a sense of, of that the nature that is being lost. I don't know, that's my, my own kind of take on it. But. I, you, I think you could read it that way, yeah. It, especially in that piece where she, she dealt with the shift between the asphalt color of the, uh, under the homes and the grass and the street, you know, that, that's really suggesting that, yeah, that that's so where we are Yeah, so you think beyond what's just there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair interpretation. Um, I just had a question. I'm kind of curious about. Uh, I was looking at the, the ones in the gallery. Um, there was an elephant and like about this big, and so they were like animals. And what I saw that they were um, they were really similar. That they all look like. I don't know if they, that's like what you use, but like they look like they were made out of like bases. No, actually, inside there's a. It's a cardboard tube about this big, and they're all the same size too. It's then sliced and pulled in. So there's a yeah, there's a similarity in scale to the actual interior structure. Thank you. Those are transfers. Um, at that time, I was doing transfers with a blender pin, and and then the bread. The print of the bread is pretty big, so here's collaboration. Jim made me a special tool to oh, dip yeah. in, was it acetone? It's, you have to do it outside. I mean, it's really bad stuff. And, and it... It separates the ink from the paper. Yeah, the color. Now um, I use, because I did transfers on the, the book, the, um, the construction book, and those I did with matte medium. You and so I've learned to do them without the... You can lift the, the ink with the matte medium and then you dissolve the paper off of it. Yeah. You so get it's a not plastic as, skin. not as toxic. Yeah. You place a lot of emphasis on negative space and perspective on the other side of that. Yes. The dialogue there, how does that associate or dissociate the memories in this dialogue? It, it's, a, it's a structural aspect of a painting that you're and and not just painting with sculpture. So I you know I'm a trained artist. It's it's embedded in my memory if nothing else. And so it's it's just another tool that's used. 
I am curious about how you work with your with your um with your ideas. Did you sketch what you're gonna do, like what you did with the dresses and stuff? Do you have an idea and then work on it or did you how do you plan for it? Usually I start I don't know, I start sometimes I start out with a structure, sometimes I start out with some images, sometimes I start out with text. Uh, and work through it. Sometimes some text will sit on my desk for five years and I'll try it in one form and I know it's not working and I put it back and bring it out again and it's just a, a process and, and at some point you know that this is the way to go and you keep going. differences or what do you think there what do you think about uh, between book art and sculpture and how they play together and whether the you know what, is there a separation there or what do you think about that? Well the the subdivision I, I I would try to call it a book but I just can't make it work. So at some point, you know, I think it's a continuum because the dictionary piece, it has houses, but because there's words, it's easier for me to call it a book. I don't know. She's it's, a book artist. I guess they're all books. Yeah. <laughs> I, Jim kept wanting me, the, the, the subdivision, Jim, Jim kept saying, well, aren't you going to put some words on it? <laughs> and it just, you know, I, I made the, the pieces in the window. There's two little houses that have the information about some of the seeds that I used. And when I was making those, I thought, well, maybe I'll mix them up. You know, put some with the words and some, and nope, don't want those. I just want it very pristine with just the seed houses. I don't know why, but... It has to be that way, um, and yeah, I can't. I can't figure out how to call it a book, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> so I guess it's a sculpture, <laughs> or it's a, a, what do you call it? A, a collage? No, not collage. Uh, Assemblage. Yes, that's the word. Um, the Well, actually, the first hat that Borrego had, uh, I didn't. I chose it because Hilde, who's sitting up behind you, had a birthday party, and she <laughs> invited everyone to make a hat when they came to the party. And so I made that hat. To make it before, before you, you came, came. And, and wear it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I, I painted that hat, and I really liked painting that hat. And it was similar to those Is that a columns. Hole along? <laughs> no, it's just a worn out hole. That's my hat. That one actually fits me. The others are brand they're newer and they're actually well, they're probably women's. Salvation Army. Yeah, they're women's hats, I think. They're small. Yeah, I saw the little pair in there. Yeah, the others I don't think have ever hardly been worn, the other two. Did you have a well, my question, I, I think, was a little bit addressed. I, that, that I see that how, Jim, you, you started as a painter, and now you're doing more sculptural work, and you're, as a book artist, are also doing sculptural pieces. So I was wondering whether there had been anything that had triggered that, you know, kind of shift. Uh, you know, I, well, I think part of it is that we both have this incredible drive to make things. <laughs> yeah, I, I just can't stop. I kind of like, I got into that structural painting thing. Three dimensional object. But also, the bigger paintings are incredibly time consuming. And they require a, a very concentrated effort, mentally. And, and time wise, and you have to have a span of big time, span of time. Just to do that. And then you're only dealing with one or two paintings. The cabinets, the animals, um, things like that. I can I can put them down and come back. I, I, you don't lose that concentration that actually a painting requires. 
and paintings paintings are much more difficult to do actually large paintings so I kind of moved away from it. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.